After graduating from Rice Baylor uh, Medical School and Baylor for General Surgery Residency, Dr. Chu, pronounced like Chu Chu Train, joined us for our plastic surgery residency at the University of Louisville, where he was an all star fellow with many awards and publications and the highest in service score ever uh, in our program at 98th percentile. He also had the highest three year average at 95th percentile. So we were very lucky that he stayed to join our uh, academic faculty team. Since uh, joining us, Dr. Chu has 23 publications, two book chapters, and over 20 meeting presentations. He has served as uh, vice president and president of the Kentucky Society of Plastic Surgery and several other national committees. Dr. Chu is our expert on wounds and uh, wounds of the lower extremity. And uh, today, Dr. Chu's grand round title is The Basics of Skin Grafts and uh, Engineered Skin Substitutes. With that, Dr. Chu, uh, we'd like to uh, have you go ahead and start your Grand Rounds presentation. Thank you, Dr. Wilhelmy, for uh, that introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a, it's a great privilege to give this talk to you. The title of my talk is Basics of Skin Grafts and Skin Substitutes. Uh, the objectives of this talk are to help uh, you understand the basic biology of skin and wound healing, to understand the basic biology of skin grafts, to understand the role of skin substitutes. So the main function of skin is to protect the body uh, from the environment, including from pathogens, um, and to maintain temperature and fluid homeostasis. There are two main overlapping layers to the skin the epidermis and the dermis. There's also a pilosebaceous unit that consists of the hair follicle and uh, its own uh, surrounding epithelium and associated sebaceous glands. The epidermis is a water impermeable layer uh, that consists primarily of keratinocytes. And like I said before, it's a, it's a physical barrier against pathogens and, and fluid loss, but it's also a chemical barrier it's a barrier against oxidant stress, and it's an immunologic barrier. Something that many people don't recognize is that the epidermis is avascular, and therefore relies on diffusion of oxygen and nutrients from the underlying dermis. And one characteristic that stands out histologically is the presence of these reet ridges. If you look at this picture on the upper left-hand corner, you see this undulating interface between the epidermis and the dermis. And these root ridges accomplish two things. First, they provide mechanical stability to the epidermis. And secondly, they increase the surface area of the capillary epidermal interface. And this really helps uh, uh, maximize nutrient supply to this avascular dermis, epidermis. And in certain slides, you'll see uh, a repeated array of capillaries that loop up very close to this uh, interface. And flattening of these root ridges with age is one of the main reasons that skin is more prone to tears and sheer injury as you get older. As you can see on the, the second uh, picture to the right. So I wanna go into the individual layers of the epidermis. Um, and as I do so, I, I want to stress that you know, each layer has its own different name, and I'll try to explain the, 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 the meaning of these names, but they're all mainly keratinocytes, just in different stages of differentiation. The mitotically active basal keratinocytes live in the deepest layer of the epidermis, called the stratum basale, and these cells are constantly replenishing the dead outer cells that are being shed. And this layer also contains melanocytes and Merkel cells, as well as stem cell precursors for both melanocytes and keratinocytes. The basal keratinocytes progressively differentiate and they migrate for the skin surface in a process called cornification. And the next layer up is the stratum spinosum. And um, you can see that the, uh, the cells become more irregular and polyhedral in shape. And their spiny appearance is uh, something that is striking, and this is due to a staining artifact that makes the desmosomes more apparent, hence the name. 
dendritic cells are also found in this layer. As the keratinocytes continue to migrate to the skin surface and they terminally differentiate, they start to produce keratohyalin, which uh, aggregates into these, these uh, basophilic granules, giving the stratum granulosum its name. And these keratin precursors eventually aggregate and they cross-link and they form bundles that act as a glue that forms the watertight barrier of the skin. Uh, the keratinocytes at this level also start secreting lamellar bodies into the extracellular space, which contain lipids that form a hydrophobic barrier uh, in the upper layers of the skin. And notice too here that um, as you're going up into this layer, the keratinocytes are becoming more squamous in shape. The stratum lucidum is a is an, a variable layer. It is uh, present uh, mainly in the thicker uh, glabrous skin of the, the palms and the soles of the feet. They're also found in the lips and, and, and they give the, the skin in these areas a, a more translucent appearance. The stratum corneum is the uppermost layer. It's made up of keratin and dead keratinocytes. And this layer varies uh, widely in thickness. This is where this is the layer that calluses develop, and within this layer, the dead keratinocytes uh, secrete defensins, which are part of the skin's first immune defense. There are other cells uh, besides keratinocytes that live in the epidermis. Um, I'm going to go through some of them here. Langerhans cells are the skin's first line defenders. Uh, they play a significant role in antigen presentation. Um, Merkel cells are uh, modified epidermal cells that function as mechanical receptors uh, for light touch mainly, and so they're very populous in the fingertips, in the palms of the, the hand, the soles of the feet, also in the oral and genital mucosa. And finally, melanocytes. The melanocytes are derived from neurocrest cells and uh, primarily produce melanin, which is responsible for the pigment of the skin. And it's the means by which the epidermis protects the body from oxidative damage. They are found um, between the cells of the stratum basale along the basement membrane, and they produce melanin, which is then donated to the neighboring basal keratinocytes. Uh, the ratio of melanocytes to keratin uh, keratinocytes is about one melanocyte per every five to six basal keratinocytes. And darker skinned individuals don't have a higher ratio. They just produce more melanin per melanocyte. So in the bottom here, you can see uh, uh, some melanocytes with their dendritic processes. Um, adjacent to those melanocytes, you can see these stippled basal keratinocytes. These are melanized basal keratinocytes. And then as you go upper into the higher layers, you can see these uh, supranuclear caps begin to form. These are melanin granules that are, that are protecting the sun-facing side of the nucleoli within the keratinocytes. So up until now, we've not talked about the hair follicle, uh, which is an important component of the skin. Um, and along with other adnexal structures, such as sweat glands and sebaceous glands, um, are an important part of the skin's ability to heal itself, to repair itself. Uh, and this is because uh, the keratinocyte uh, stem cells and melanocyte stem cells are both originate from the hair follicle, specifically at the bulge and sub-bulge regions. These uh, stem cells then replenish the melanocytes that uh, give, uh, that, that live in the bulb of the hair follicle and give hair its color. Um, but they can also be recruited uh, during wound healing to support a re -epithelialization. And uh, this bulge region is probably the primary place where these stem cells reside, but they are found in several other places, uh, including the basement membrane of the epidermis, like we talked about, and also the infundibulum of the hair follicle. And so in response to epidermal injury, all these nests can participate in repair of the skin.
this is a picture of a burn, and I thought that this was very, um, a, uh, uh, very informative and, and, and gives you a lot of information if you just observe. This is a burn of, ver of varying stages of uh, reepithelialization. And notice here, uh, centrally, there's an area of deeper burn that has not fully reepithelialized. And you can start to see these pearly shaped buds that represent reepithelialization from the hair follicles. And then in the upper right hand corner, you see an area of shallower burn, which is already epithelialized. And you can notice that it's also starting to repigment. And this repigmentation is emanating from the hair follicles as well. And this is generally an observation that uh, many people have made. You know, both um, reepithelialization and repigmentation proceed from the hair follicles in partial thickness injuries. And uh, in general, repigmentation is more variable uh, than reepithelialization, and it usually lags behind reepithelialization. So there's abundant evidence for the importance of hair follicles for uh, reepithelialization of injured skin. Um, this first row, of, the top row of pictures here, shows a partial thickness wound into the papillary dermis at various time points. And notice um, that you see the uh, uh, the pigmented spots uh, again coming from the hair follicles. And then if you look at um, picture D. In the upper right hand corner, you can see that this wound has fully epithelialized and it is also repigmented, although in, in patches. The second row of pictures is a full thickness wound. So this is complete loss of the epidermis, dermis, and adnexal structures. And this shows the progression of this type of wound over the same, same time frame. And so if you notice, um, there's not that same stippled pattern of uh, reepithelialization. And because these hair follicles are lost, this wound is forced to reepithelialize by secondary intention. And so you see this epithelialization and repigmentation proceed from the periphery of the wound. And the results are incomplete uh, pigmentation, uh, although there's complete uh, epithelialization. And this picture doesn't really show it, show it very well, but uh, that is a hypertrophic scar in H. So I've already started to talk about how the epidermis responds to injury, and I want to go into this in greater detail. Reepithelialization uh, re um, is an essential component of wound healing, and it's what most of us consider the defining endpoint for wound healing. Without a full reepithelialization, a wound really can't be considered healed. And furthermore, there's a, a failure to maintain epithelialization that contributes to wound recurrence, and that is also a very significant clinical problem. I want to introduce here an important distinction between wound repair and wound regeneration. Regeneration after injury means that the result of healing is a functional recreation of that tissue whereas repair simply means creation of a non-functional scar. And the epidermis is, an, is a layer that is able to regenerate after injury and resume all of its functions as a physical barrier, chemical barrier, and so on and so forth. The only thing that it lacks is the adnexal structures. So in the next uh, slide, I want to show the sequence of repair when skin is wounded. So first you have an initial gap that is filled with a hemostatic plug, and this prevents further blood loss and provides a um, provisional matrix that you know, gives the wound its initial stability. Next you have uh, epidermal cells at the edges of the wound that lose contact inhibition with other cells and with their basement membranes and, are, uh, and begin to migrate into the wound. And then if you look at the base of the, uh, of the wound, you can see an influx of macrophages and endothelial cells that form the beginnings of granulation tissue and new ECM deposition in the place of this, this plug. 
you have further um, migration of these epidermal keratinocytes, uh, which is then sustained by the mitotic activity of the trailing cells. And eventually, these migrating keratinocytes fill the wound gap and displace the original clot, which is now an eschar that is starting to separate. And once these migrating keratinocytes come into contact with one another, they stop migrating. Now, once the gap created by the wound has been fully bridged, you then resume a mitotic activity within the new layer of keratinocytes to restore the epidermal thickness. And then these cells undergo progressive uh, differentiation and cornification to regenerate the epidermis. Now, let's look at, uh, uh, more closely at that last figure. And I want to, to point out what's going on in the dermis, because the dermis has a different response to injury than the epidermis. Uh, at the time of uh, healing, most of the capillaries of the, of the granulation tissue have been reabsorbed. But um, as this picture tries to show, the dermis is not regenerated. And in its place, you have a dense, relatively avascular scar that is composed mainly of type 1 collagen. So this leads me to my uh, next important point that I'd like to make, which is that while epidermis regenerates, dermis scars. So what are the key features of a scar on histology? Well, they include the loss of reed ridges. Um, you, you see these dense uh, collagen fibers that are uh, parallel to the skin surface. This is a key feature. In uh, hypertrophic and keloid scars, these fibers actually form these dense whorls of tightly bound collagen. Uh, in a scar, you'll also see uh, loss of adnexal structures and a higher cellularity, especially in the papillary dermis. So in comparison to the epidermis, the dermis, despite being the less cellular layer, is actually the more complex layer. And the dermis has important um, implications for how a wound will heal. And, and we can just consider some observations. The dermal layer is the most important layer in reestablishing wound tensile strength and determining the appearance of a scar. Uh, we know that keloids and hypertrophic scars do not form unless the wound reaches the dermis. Uh, scar contracture occurs at the level of the dermis. And thick skin grafts with greater dermal component uh, generally lead to less scar contracture, uh, greater stability, and greater resistance to infection. And so one can make a very persuasive argument that when it comes to wound healing, the dermis is really where the action is. So this is kind of uh, elaborating further on, on the previous slides. Um, when the dermis is replaced by scar, hair follicles, adnexal structures, the actual components of the dermis itself none of this actually forms again. And scar is uh, inferior to uninjured tissue in almost every single way, from a mechanical aspect, from a structural aspect, from a, an aesthetic as, uh, aspect, and uh, a functional aspect. Some other things that um, we care about um, with regard to scar, especially in little children, is that extensive scars do not grow with the child. And so while scar formation after dermal injury is unavoidable, there's a wide body of evidence that prolonging the inflammatory phase leads to more exuberant scar formation. And Dr. Bozeman, um, in his talk last week, discussed several benefits to early excision and grafting of burns. And uh, to this list, I would add limiting the degree of pathologic scar formation. So the question is, why does scar have to form in the first place? Um, there are a number of, uh, of species, lower order species, that scar without, uh, that heal without scar, and they can actually regenerate in, un, uh, uninjured tissue, such as planarians, salamanders, reptiles. But even some mammals have this ability, uh, in particular the spiny mouse. Um, 
it can actually auto amputate its skin and completely regenerate whole skin. That includes hair follicles, dermis, sweat glands, fur even. And this is all done with very little scarring. In, in most mammals, however, the, the only time that dermal injury heals without producing scars is during the fetal stage of life. And why this is has been extensively studied, but nobody really knows. And, and one of the thoughts is that, you know, scar formation is the price that mammals pay for a healing mechanism that prioritizes speed under dirty conditions, you know, where a redundant rapid inflammatory response is adaptive and helps an organism survive uh, what would be a fatal, fatal wound. So in other words, as, as far as nature is concerned, aesthetics and optimal function are merely style points and sometimes you just need to drive the car home. I want to spend a little bit of time discussing what exactly the dermis is composed of. And surprisingly, um, it's composed of very few cells. Um, the principal cell is, of the dermis is the fibroblast, which is mainly responsible for laying down extracellular matrix. And um, the biggest component of the dermis is probably not a cell at all. It's, it's the extracellular matrix. The ECM maintains a resting tension and structural integrity of the skin. And this resting tension can be seen in a number of ways. You can see this in the contraction of skin grafts. You can see this in the gaping of wounds and skin wounds rel relative to relaxed skin tension lines. You can see this in the tendency of blood vessels and nerves to retract once they're cut. Um, the ECM is also responsible for maintaining the mechanical strength of the skin. And finally, uh, perhaps most importantly, the ECM interacts with cells and is a critical part of cell-to-cell uh, -cell signaling both in homeostasis and in the skin's response to injury. And a major example of this is the interaction between the ECM and myofibroblasts via transforming growth factor beta-1, which is considered the master regulator of fibrosis. And in uninjured tissue, um, the TGF beta-1 is bound by ECM in an inactive form. But in response to injury and inflammation, it is cleaved and released in its active form in a number of ways, and I've listed some of them here. This includes everything from mechanical stress, um, uh, acidic conditions, uh, matrix, matrix metalloproteinases, activated macrophages, reactive oxygen species, um, and a number of cell signaling uh, molecules, uh, most important of which are integrins. And activated TGF beta 1, in turn, activates fibroblasts and promotes their differentiation into myofibroblasts. So the, in, uh, so the fibroblast proliferates. It lays down ECM proteins, initially fibronectin, then later collagen 3 and 1. And then it also converts to a myofibroblast phenotype that expresses alpha smooth muscle actin. And these organize into stress filaments that cause contraction of the cell. And then, um, amazingly, these forces are then translated to the surrounding uh, ECM network via these focal adhesion complexes that are in green. And these are mainly integrins. Again, integrins are a critical part of, of the cell-to-cell -cell signaling. So summary of important points, again, epidermis regenerates after injury, uh, injury through keratinocyte migration and stem cell niches. Stable reepithelialization is an important defining endpoint for wound healing. Dermis does not regenerate after injury, but is replaced by scar. Scar, uh, while it does provide a stable restoration of skin barrier, it's inferior with respect to important structural, aesthetic, and functional aspects. There is a direct link between inflammation and scar formation, as well as wound contracture. 
uh, TGF beta 1 activates fibroblasts and myofibroblasts in the scar response to injury. And then finally, integrins are a major node of communication between the ACM and fibroblasts in the fibroproliferative stage of wound healing. So now that we've kind of laid the, 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 the groundwork for, um, for skin healing, the rest of this talk will focus on skin grafts and skin substitutes. The large areas of skin loss uh, increase the risk of infection, insensible losses, hypertrophic and keloid scarring, significant car scar contractures. Um, and so for large areas, skin grafting is still the gold standard for coverage. And like any graft, skin grafts are dependent on the wound bed for survival. And so uh, a well-vascularized wound bed is mandatory. And, and, and so bone without periosteum, cartilage without perichondrium, tendon without peritinon, these are all poor substrates for skin grafting. And skin grafts will not take on infected tissue or dead tissue. There's a question about whether skin grafts take uh, worse on, on fat or fascia, and people are divided on this. I think part of the, the problem is the difficulty in bolstering these, but um, most people have, have found that skin grafts take as readily on fat and fascia as they do on other wound beds. So this is a slide that's familiar to, to many of you, not all. As soon as the skin graft is laid down, there's a, a race between revascularization and ischemia. So if the, if the skin graft does not get revascularized in time, it'll die. In the first few days, the graft survives by plasmatic imbibition, which is just a passive diffusion of, uh, of nutrients and oxygen. Beginning at two days, uh, the recipient and donor capillaries align. This process is called inoscillation. And then beginning at about four days, there's full ingrowth of capillaries into the graft. And until that time, the graft must be bolstered to minimize shearing as well as hematoma and seroma formation. Skin grafts can be categorized by thickness as well. And generally, um, there are trade-offs to consider when deciding on how thick of a skin graft to take. So a thin skin graft is about five to 12 thousandths of an inch. A medium skin graft uh, split thickness is anywhere from 12 to 18 thousandths, and then a thick is anything beyond that. And obviously full thickness is uh, a full thickness layer of skin and uh, of epidermis and dermis. And in general, uh, the thicker the graft and the higher the dermal content, the greater uh, stability that you have and the greater quality of reconstruction, the lower the degree of contraction as well. Obviously though, thicker grafts are limited by donor site availability, and they also have greater metabolic requirements and therefore a higher risk of graft failure, especially in a suboptimal wound bed. Skin grafts can also be classified by their source. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory, autographs are from the same person, same subject. Homographs are from different people, but um, uh, within the same species. And they are also called allografts. And then xenografts are, are grafts from different species. Uh, briefly, uh, I want to talk about homographs. Again, these are skin grafts from um, other patients or other, other people. Um, these are very important in the, they have their role in the management of patients, especially in patients with severe burn injuries. And their general indications are for temporary biologic coverage in extensive burns. Uh, also, they can be used to prepare the wound bed for autografting and, and also serve as a template for delayed application of cultured uh, epidermal autographs. And uh, we'll go into cultured epidermal autographs here in a bit. They're very effective at reducing pain, at reducing water uh, and insensible losses. Um, homographs have been found to protect wounds from bacterial contamination. However, there are problems, um, one being rejection. 
Uh, these are only temporary. And there's also uh, the question of disease transmission. I want to mention briefly uh, composite graphs, which are full thickness skin graphs that uh, also carry either cartilage or bone. And this is mainly of historical interest, but it's still used in a few clinical scenarios, such as fingertip replantations in children, also in composite tissue graphs for very uh, delicate uh, defects of the nose, like the soft triangle of the nose or the, or the ala of the nose. And the reason I bring this up here in this talk is because there is this thing called the bridging phenomenon which describes the ability of skin grafts to survive over small avascular defects through vascular ingrowth from the periphery. And so this picture here is of a, a composite graft that is uh, on, its, on, a, on a given wound bed and, and the cartilage that it's supporting cannot, is, is blocking any revascularization centrally and so the skin graft over that cartilage has to get its blood supply from revascularization from the periphery. And we talked about how skin grafts, um, you know, need to be revascularized before they become ischemic. And so because of this, um, uh, the, the actual size of these composite grafts are somewhat limited. So no greater than 0.5 to 1 centimeter in size. And so while, while this is definitely something that is observed, is widely observed, um, given its limitations, it's generally unreliable for reconstructive purposes. And this, by the way, applies to not just composite grafts, but um, in, in wounds with uh, avascular segments. So it doesn't really matter if the cartilage is on the graft or on the wound bed, the net effect is still the same. And so for these reasons, skin grafts are really impractical for wounds that have denuded tendon or bone or cartilage or any kind of poorly vascularized segment. And for most clinicians, the, pre the presence of these things is a contraindication to skin grafting. So having said all those things, I, I wanna talk a little bit now about skin substitutes and, and, and what exactly they do uh, and, and when they can be used. And I want to make an important d d distinction here too, because there are lots of skin products out there and um, it's very difficult to keep up with just the amount of, of skin substitutes and, and, and treatments there are. And I want to limit the scope of this talk to skin substitutes. Um, there are a lot of things that you can put on wounds that are biologically active um, uh, and are, are more considered wound dressings. Um, I want to talk about uh, skin substitutes, things that can actually be either temporary or permanent uh, uh, substitutes for skin. Uh, so with that said, skin grafts can replace dermis, but again, as I mentioned before, they're limited by donor site availability and higher metabolic demands. And as I also mentioned, wounds are not always amenable to skin grafting acute wounds with unfavorable vascular segments, as we talked about. Uh, also chronic wounds where uh, healing has, has, has stalled. And these are really the situations where skin grafts, or, or skin substitutes, I should say, can be useful. I wanna talk briefly about the history of skin substitutes. Uh, the first milestone is uh, the in vitro culture of keratinocytes in the 60s, and this led to the development of cultured epidermal autographs. Next came the design of a dermo-epidermal substitute, or aplograph, which consists of human allogeneic fibroblasts and keratinocytes that are seeded in a, uh, a degradable scaffold. And I also want to mention Integra, which is developed in the 1980s and consists of bovine collagen and shark chondroitin sulfate. It's a scaffold, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, going forward, I want to discuss uh, some of these substitutes and, and their pros and cons in wound repair and regeneration. And um, I wanna say that um, the previous slide, um, you know, 
most of the uh, the current products that are out there today are are descended from in in some way from from these uh, initial um, skin substitutes, um, and uh, and share many common features. But um, essentially, those features are recreating the the substance of the dermis, you know, and as I mentioned in, in, in some slides back, the dermis is is mainly extracellular matrix and fibroblasts, and so there's most of these products have some combination of that when they're replacement of dermis, and um, and and I'll go into that in a little bit. But first, epidermal substitutes. These are inspired by the uh, cultured epidermal autographs and essentially rely on in vitro expansion of autologous keratinocytes that are obtained by skin biopsy. There are plenty of uh, types out there. There's Epicel, Epidex, MySkin are some examples. Recell is a newer approach. And I think that probably Dr. Franklin or Dr. Bozeman could talk more about this than I can. They certainly uh, have a lot more experience with this than, than, than I do. The advantages of, of these epidermal substitutes are that they can expand available donor site and they can be um, important in, in, in massive burns where you don't have much donor site. The disadvantages, though, are, are pretty lengthy. There's a long preparation time, about three weeks. There's poor keratinocyte attachment. It's very difficult to handle. There's poor mechanical stability uh, due to the lack of any kind of dermal component. There's also poor uh, resistance uh, to infection and higher production costs. Next, I want to talk about uh, dermal substitutes. And these can be divided broadly into two main types. So uh, the first type is processed human dermis. And these are probably things that uh, many people are familiar with, such as Alloderm, Matriderm, Dermamatrix. Flex HD. And the second category are engineered dermal substitutes that are engineered again around the main components of the dermis, ECM and fibroblasts. And so some uh, important examples are Dermagraft, which contains cryopreserved human fibroblasts from human foreskin that are seated on a biodegradable scaffold. Integra, which I talked about before, uh, as well as Matriderm, which is a collagen matrix that's coated with elastin. So the first category, um, processed human dermis. The best example of this, uh, the one that we use most frequently, is Alloderm. And this is, again, an acellular dermal allograft that is derived from cadaveric skin. And so how this is rendered acellular is they, the, the, the epidermis is, is shaved off and, and the fibroblasts within the dermis are extracted. Uh, so alloderm is, uh, um, it, it, it's in this process of uh, making it acellular, it still maintains the structural and, and biochemical properties of the ECM while containing no cellular components. And we use this quite a bit in breast reconstruction uh, for shaping of the breast pocket, for control of the breast pocket. And, and what we found um, over the years of using this is that um, it significantly reduces capsular contracture around breast implants. And, and there have been lots of studies early on with this product that have shown that uh, Alloderm reduced capsular, capsular contracture rates the rate of granulation tissue formation, and markers of inflammation within the capsule itself. And there have been more recent studies that have looked at um, uh, uh, the use of Alloderm and found decreased levels of uh, TGF-beta-1, uh, decreased populations of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts within the capsule uh, in cases where ADM was used. Uh, it's not apparent um, to, to many people, but ADM is also used in burns, um, especially in the resurfacing of late complications of burn contractures. Uh, so as you can see in this picture here, uh, this is a child who had a significant 
flexion contracture of the neck from a burn. And this was uh, reconstructed uh, in two stages, first with alloderm and then with a very thin split thickness skin graft. There are problems with, uh, with alloderm and with all uh, ADMs, uh, especially when it comes to resurfacing skin. Um, there's definitely a small but increased risk of infection. And this is not a feature that's uh, 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 unique to alloderm. It, it's a feature of many skin substitutes, which I'll go into a little bit later. And when they're combined with skin grafts, they can only support very thin skin grafts. And, and finally, there's a theoretical risk of uh, disease transmission. Uh, next, I want to talk about engineered dermal substitutes. And these are also referred to as dermal regeneration templates. And, and the clue, as far as their function goes, is in the name itself, uh, regeneration, dermal regeneration. That's a pretty bold claim. But the idea is that uh, the use of these substitutes facilitates regeneration of dermis as opposed to scar tissue. Now, there's no substitute uh, currently available that actually regenerates dermis. And, uh, and, and a, a term that you'll see uh, used a lot is neodermis, which is uh, something that resembles dermis and has some uh, uh, shared similarities but is not uh, dermis in, 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 its, in its completion. Integra is a most uh, is a most well-known example. Again, it's a collagen chondroitin matrix that provides a scaffold for cellular infiltration of vascular ingrowth. And um, and it's a and it has a native collagen structure and the presence of these ligands that bind to integrins, and we talked about that in, in, in some of the slides before, that are expressed by fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. And these sort of sequester these fibroblasts, and they reduce um, their activity, thereby um, reducing wound contracture and, and, and uh, scarring. And so this top picture that you see here is a wound that has been allowed to heal by secondary intention, and you can see the, the surface staining of the dermis, that is, uh, those are myofibroblasts. Uh, the lower wound, uh, the lower picture, I should say, is a wound that has been resurfaced by Integra and is yet to be skin grafted. And here you can see that um, the, the fibroblasts, um, uh, the myofibroblasts are less dense and there's a more random orientation. And both of those are uh, thought to lead to a reduction in, contra uh, in uh, wound contraction when Integra is used. So not only does uh, the resurface skin have a reduced contraction, but there's an actual neodermis that forms. And so this picture here uh, shows uh, what such neodermis looks like. And it looks remarkably similar to an actual skin. You see a physiologic epidermis. Uh, you see a physiologic appearing dermis. You see these capillary loops that are uh, extending into these root ridges. Uh, and you see randomly oriented collagen. The only thing that really is missing is the adnexal structures, you know, like hair and sweat glands and so on and so forth. And so this is why it's not really, can be truly considered a dermis. It's called a neodermis. But some of the benefits of dermis are gained. So long-term results show that reconstruction with dermal regeneration templates leads to improved elasticity that is similar to normal skin. Uh, skin grafts in combination with uh, dermal regeneration templates are able to grow with the patient. This is important in pediatric burns. And, and, it's, and, the, and the skin is, uh, is amenable to tissue expansion, at least more so than, than scarred, scarred tissue. So common indications for dermal regeneration templates are uh, extensive burns, and this is far and away the most common application of dermal regeneration templates. This kind of allows you to get the benefits of having that dermal layer without needing to harvest a thick skin graft. Uh, and this is very important when you have uh, limited donor site availability. 
A second common indication for DRTs is revision of flexion contractures and hypertrophic scars. And sometimes they're used initially in the reconstruction over areas that are prone to these things uh, or areas where mobility is essential. I want to go back to that previous slide. If you recall that previous slide where I talked about the bridging phenomenon, well, this has relevance in DRTs because the same idea can be applied. Because DRTs are acellular, um, there is not the metabolic demand that autographs have. And, and, and so this is why they are better able to bridge avascular gaps. And so this schematic shows the difference between how a standard graft behaves over, like, say, an area of exposed bone versus how uh, a dermal regeneration template behaves. And the main difference is that um, the central portion of a skin graft over exposed bone dies because it is not revascularized in time. Whereas Integra uh, is able to bridge that defect more readily and therefore provide a, a better substrate for subsequent skin grafting. And so the use of Integra, um, uh, well, I should say Integra is used and has been used very successfully in exposed bone, exposed tendon, exposed cartilage. So this is, these are some case examples. This is not my case. This is a patient who had a severe electrical burn of the foot. And when debridement was completed, uh, there were several areas of uh, exposed tendon, a denuded tendon. And this was uh, preliminarily uh, covered with, with uh, Integra. And then after a period of about six, uh, about three to four weeks, resurfaced with a uh, superficial uh, split thickness skin graft. These are some examples of mine. Um, uh, I've had some patients who, with uh, locally advanced uh, skin cancers uh, that required um, removal of the uh, pericranium uh, to obtain adequate margins, uh, obtain negative margins, and, 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 and leaving this um, bare calvarium, uh, as you can see here, in the second picture. And so normally in situations like this, you know, if the patient is not a candidate for a flap, um, the process of covering this with the skin graft involves uh, burring of the outer table or fenestrating it and allowing uh, granulation tissue to form, which then can be uh, grafted onto. Um, so instead of, of doing this, um, I, I, I used Integra directly on the spare calvarium and, and waited the three, four weeks for um, that wound bed to form and then uh, placed a, a split thickness skin graft over it. And the results have been very good and very durable. And this is yet another example treated with a similar technique. There are disadvantages. Uh, to uh, these dermal regeneration templates and skin substitutes. Um, specifically, dermal regeneration templates require two stages. And just like any uh, skin substitute, um, they are prone to infection. The same property of being acellular that makes them better suited to complex defects also makes them more prone to infection. And, and this, is th this is one of the reasons why there's such a steep learning curve when it comes to these products. And part of the issue also is that, uh, that the skin substitutes are not always used in a goal-directed manner. And we end up asking too much of them, you know, placing them over questionable tissue, for example, or expecting them to resurrect dead tissue. So always when using these products, it's important um, to adhere to the principles of adequate debridement, you know, to clean viable tissue. And this is even more true in skin substitutes. I think the, the, the way to approach the use of skin substitutes um, is to have modest or realistic expectations. So skin substitutes, um, they cannot defy physiology and basic surgical principles. 
And it's important to uh, first have a goal in mind or a specific problem that you're trying to solve with the use of skin substitutes. Maybe it, it's uh, flexion contractures or a, a difficult wound that has been that has stalled or a radiated wound, for example. And then next, uh, try to start to learn a few very well and figure out what they can and can't do. Uh, for now, at least, skin substitutes, uh, they will not be the star of the team. They're going to be the humble role players who can nevertheless serve you well and help you out of difficult spots if you uh, learn how and when to use them. And that's it. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Dr. Uh, Dr. Chu, thanks for that excellent and thorough uh, review of skin, skin grafts and skin substitutes. Uh, now we know the, uh, the scientific basis for the root of the phrase, the wound is too deep to heal without a scar. Wound care has uh, been an astronomical economical enterprise for big farm and medical technology uh, industry with uh, very aggressive uh, reps. How would you uh, give advice to someone looking into new skin substitutes for challenging wounds? Um, thank you, Dr. Wuhami. Uh, so what I would uh, advise is, yes, it is very challenging um, to keep up with the amount of products that are out there. Um, if you look at uh, many of these products, though, they, the way that they uh, apply for approval is through a pathway called the 510k pathway which basically is stating um, that a new product is substantially equivalent to something that is already out there in the market and um, so when considering a, 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 a skin substitute or a, a dermal regeneration uh, template um, I would first kind of direct people towards the products that are that are already established and have a lot of literature to support their use. Uh, Integra has been here for, by the way, I'm, I have no financial relationship to Integra and uh, I, I feel like that's necessary to say that. Um, but, you know, products like Integra have been around for uh, since the 1980s and there's a, a huge body of literature uh, to support their use in, in certain scenarios and so um, I think that I would I would gravitate more towards the ones that have uh, a long uh, long um, history of use and then if you're considering a new product uh, try to see what um, products it is similar to and and try to figure out other considerations like you know cost benefit analysis and and, and things like that to help you determine whether or not it's something that you want to try. Um, I think informed consent is also an important process that we uh, do not put enough emphasis on. Um, it's important to talk to the patients about about this, and this is also another reason why, you know, uh, off-label use of, of certain skin products uh, is a very hotly debated topic nowadays. Uh, for example, Alloderm and, and the use of the Alloderm for for breast reconstruction is is something that is at least for the time being off label, and so you know there's an important consent process that goes with that, and I think the same applies to any skin graft, any mm -hmm. any skin substitute, anything that you're putting in another patient's body. Are there any other uh, questions from? From the floor, Brad. This is Hiram Polk. Could you, um, as Dr. Chu, please um, make some comments about the the usefulness or non-usefulness of of bank skin, uh, cadaver skin that's retained, which we've always had a goodly number at uh, at U of L. Would you comment about its place and how it physiologically functions? I personally am a big fan of. Of, of homographs and banked skin. Um, 
I understand that there are different ways that it is banked. Some of it is, is freeze uh, frozen or is frozen and some of it is treated with, uh, I think, glycerol. Um, and there are different uh, effects of, of those types of preparations. But the main, the main usefulness that I see is uh, as, as a temporary uh, wound dressing um, to minimize, uh, you know, insensible losses and, and uh, reduce the risk of infection. And it also has a benefit um, when, when, um, when autograft is precious and you don't want to risk um, losing autograft in a wound that has not been adequately prepared. Um, seeing how uh, homograft does in such wounds is, is, I think, I find that very useful. And so in situations where uh, you have wounds that are uh, somewhat marginal and you're not sure, I think that it definitely has a role. Could could you comment on yeah, on you, you. could you comment on whether you like to let the the uh, homograph reject quote slough off or do you try to take it off in, at some prime time before that rejection begins and then do a a, a split thickness skin graft? Oh, I see. Um, so I, I generally do uh, take it off in about uh, one maybe two weeks. Um, okay. Generally, at, after two weeks, it does slough off on its own, although in severe burns and patients who are immunocompromised because of it, uh, they can actually be present for quite a while. But generally, I, I like to take it off, you know, within, you know, one to two weeks. I think okay. it leads less <laughs> to uh, skin graft. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is Gordon Tobin. I'd, I'd, I'd like to just further comment on the use of homograft and, and uh, much appreciation to Dr. Polk for making this a burn center when he came here. That was emphasized uh, strongly in the surgical teaching program and has brought an enormous value to that. The second person that I'd like to recognize is Dr. Neil Garrison for setting up the uh, uh, bank of donated organs, which included the harvesting of skin. So we had an enormous amount of homograft available to us uh, um, at the Children's Hospital burn unit and then the transition over to the new University Hospital burn unit. Um, and our experience was exceptionally favorable. And the best thing that the homograft allowed was the development of a more vascular bed uh, on the burn, on the debrided burn surface, so that the 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 graft could then be removed. And generally, we would take it off in around six to seven days at, when you had uh, sufficient angiogenesis to see a vascular bed, and then put a, a split thickness skin graft on it. It was a very successful technique, and I think it remains a very valuable element of the armamentarium in burn care. Probably not used enough. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Chu for uh, giving a great uh, Grand Rounds presentation, a lot of information about wound healing and burns uh, that'll be useful for our trainees. And uh, just ask one question. We've had at least, uh, and I have no experience, but uh, with these cultured uh, uh, skin uh, uh, solutions for, for burn patients, uh, at least in one M&M presentation, there was the uh, suggestion that uh, the decision making might have led to a bad outcome to try and use this product. And uh, in, in burn patients where the tried and true method of, uh, of uh, autograph, uh, even when donor sites are limited, uh, has, has led to favorable results for many years. Where do you see the place of these cultured uh, uh, skin products and when does it make sense to even consider using it? Oh, thank you very much, Dr. McMasters. Um, so I, I, I would and, and, and if, if Dr. Franklin or Dr. Bozeman uh, uh, are here and would care to, to comment as well, um, I'd, I'd invite their uh, commentary. Uh, I think that 
the main issue with uh, these um, cultured epidermal autographs is that they're that it it's purely epidermal cells that are they're purely keratinocytes and they only take as well as uh, the bed that they're placed on and without any type of dermal component uh, to um, to these graphs um, they are not very um, not very durable uh, and so I think that you know as much emphasis on uh, stability of uh, re-epithelialization as, as the actual epithelialization itself, uh, that's important. Um, so I think that there are ways that improve the, the, the stability of epidermal cult uh, cultured epidermal autographs. And, and one of the ways that I learned uh, actually in the process of this making this presentation is that uh, there is a, th that there's a combination, uh, whether that's the use of homograph to kind of as Dr. Tobin alluded to, kind of prime the wound bed, not just for autographs, traditional kind, but also for cultured epidermal autographs that's been studied, uh, the use of dermal templates, and then combine that with cultured epidermal autographs. I think that that's the direction that it's going because you do need some sort of dermal component in order for these, these graphs to, to have some chance of, of, of staying. Um, otherwise, they're just going to slough off easily with any kind of shear or even the slightest bit of infection. Oh, I'll add just, just to. Like, uh, uh, go ahead, Gordon. I'll, I'll add this for, very quickly. We gained an, an, an enormous experience with this when Greg Brown set up a, uh, a laboratory for production of this. It was within room 11 at the University Hospital. And there is a single indication for these, and that is the massive burn. Uh, it's life saving, and in a massive in a massive burn, you can come back and deal with the unstable scars in other ways. But for small burns, they have no role whatsoever, in my opinion. Right. That, thank that's you, Dr. Tobin. I'm afraid we're, and thank you, Dr. Chu, for excellent uh, uh, grand rounds presentation this morning. Uh, we're out of time and need to move into our quality improvement conference because uh, of the limitations of my background noise, I'm going to uh, 